This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery, and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And welcome to Where Did the Road Go? This week I have part two of our interview with Jeffrey Kripal, with uh, Michael Hughes helping me on this one. Uh, before we get to that, however, a few things I want to mention. Uh, both Mike, myself, and Joshua Cutchin will all be appearing at Fort Fest 2016. That's down in Maryland. Hanover, Maryland, to be exact. Um, it's going to be at the Ramada Inn on June 11th, and uh, on June 12th, it will be at Dave & Buster's. I don't have the full lineup of people. I know Dr. Henry Bauer will be there, Gary Sudbrink, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Samuel Barr, and uh, I believe a few others. So if you're in the area or you want to take the trip out, that's June 11th and 12th. You can find more on the Facebook page for Where Did the Road Go, and I'll put a link up on wheredidtheroadgo.com as well. I know people have been having um, download issues. The problem with the download issues is that they're all different. Um, some of you are having problems downloading it on iTunes where it downloads the whole file and then says there's an error. I don't know what's causing that. There's nothing I've been able to do to fix it. And I've tried quite a lot. Most people have no problems with it, which makes it even stranger. Other people can't download it off the website, but they can get it on iTunes just fine. So I don't really know where the issues are. They're very scattered and inconsistent. So, I mean, I'm working on it, but there's, there's not a whole lot I can do to figure it out. If it doesn't work one way for you, I'm trying to make as many options as possible for people to get a copy of the show. Um, feel free to write me if you're having issues. Uh, maybe sooner or later someone will, will say something that will trigger the solution. I, I don't know. Um, it's very frustrating, and I'm sure it's frustrating to anyone trying to listen as well. We are still collecting listener stories. And uh, if you go to wheredidtheroadgo.com, there's a link, and I believe the email to submit is stories at wheredidtheroadgo.com, and we'll do a listener stories episode when I get enough stories collected. And of course, don't forget, we have a forum on wheredidtheroadgo.com as well, as well as a group for wheredidtheroadgo.com on Facebook, not only a page you can like. All right, so that's, that's everything I needed to get over right now, and uh, here, jumping right back into the conversation is our interview with Jeffrey Kripal about his new book, The Supernatural, authored uh, along with Whitley Strieber. Here we go. Yeah, it, since since we just touched on magic, which is a, a subject I love, um, <clears throat> uh, there's a th could you could you talk about your quote? How you give uh, Arthur C. Clarke's famous uh, quote a, a little twist of your own? Right, I'm working from memory here, so. Um, I have so, yeah. it if you want. Can you want me to why throw you, it out there for you? Yeah, yeah, why don't you read it? And what page are, page are you on so I can find uh, it? I, I have it typed up. So unfortunately, oh, okay. yeah. Um, what, what you wrote was, um, any sufficiently profound magical event is indistinguishable from technology. All right. Right. So... So this is really a kind of a response to the ancient aliens um, interpretive move. In, in the beginning of the book, um, I essentially comment on two popular ways that UFO phenomena are understood in the media. Um, one of them works from the present worldview and projects that worldview back into every past. So this is the Arthur C. Clarke quote that people love to throw out, that every, um, every uh, sufficiently sophisticated technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the move of, of a show like Ancient Aliens in which 
any magical experience or, or supernatural event in the past is actually just primitive people who didn't have enough science encountering some kind of ancient astronaut or ancient alien who was simply using technology. And so it's really a very materialistic, very reductive reading that there is no magic, there is nothing like the paranormal, it's all just technology. The other reading works from a past worldview and projects it into, into the present. And this is when, um, for example, fundamentalist Christians will, will read a UFO event as demonic. So they'll, they just accept the reality of demons in this, this first century biblical world, and they read that forward into the present and kind of shove everything into that. And so a lot of what the book does is resist both of those readings. Uh, we shouldn't be privileging our present technological worldview as absolute, nor should we be privileging our ancient religious worldviews as absolute. We should be thinking about these things in new ways. And the Arthur C. Clarke quote, um, I then flip, essentially, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it becomes any sufficiently magical event is, is in, indistinguishable from, from technology. In other words, magical things do happen. Paranormal events do happen. And we can read those as forms of technology, as a lot of the science fiction and the extraterrestrial folks want to do. But that's, that's not really convincing at the end of the day, because that never it never quite works um, so I it, it was just it was just me flipping Arthur C. Clarke who by the way himself was really interested in the paranormal mm -hmm. and then got quite disillusioned with it mm. uh, he had quite a journey around the paranormal when he wrote Childhood's End he he pretty much believed all of it uh, and towards the end of his life, I, he believed almost none of it, but he still held on to kind of this core belief that some of it, there was something to some of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just trying to, it, with that flip, I'm just trying to resist, Michael, this notion of reading everything magical or paranormal as a function of technology. Mm -hmm which I don't think is true. I just, I just think it's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you, um, w one of the other fascinating things I, I uh, pulled out of Authors of the Impossible was uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Jacques Vallée and Alan Hynek were both sort of, uh, I guess, Hynek more so, but, but basically sort of closet esotericists and Rosicrucians. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, yeah. I mean... So, yeah, Heineck was, was very senior to, to Valet, of course. Um, Valet was working with Heineck in the 60s and, and into the 70s, and they were friends till, till Heineck died. But it really wasn't till much later in life that Valet discovered that Heineck had had a profound kind of interest in Rosicrucianism and esotericism in general. Uh, as did Valet, Jacques was ne never, to my knowledge, you know, a Rosicrucian. It, mm -hmm. if, if, mm -hmm. if anybody is, I guess. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of tradition where, you know, it's hard to say, I guess, who is and who's not. So Be being invented in the first place, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Val Valet clearly had profound esoteric interests that are very clear in books like Passport to Magonia and The Invisible College. Hynix, I think, were much more private and, and, um, and, and Jacques really didn't know about them until much later in life and was sort of shocked to learn that, that they both had this, this history with Rosicrucians. Mm -hmm. um, which again speaks to part of Valet's thesis that the UFO phenomena is more properly located or contextualized in the history of folklore and esotericism mm -hmm. and not not 
in the, the context of, of, um, of uh, science and technology, although he, of course, is very interested in that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, too, about... Uh uh, about the the parallels because uh, I'm not sure I don't recall many instances in in your books that I've read you may have written or spoken about it elsewhere but the uh, the the similarity with uh, like you know the DMT experience and and other you know uh, entities people b believe they meet under you know while while uh, under the influence of psychedelics right so so what's the question though? Uh, the question is, I, um, do, do you see, um, w do you think there's, a, there's a, a commonality? Do you see any, any differences? Is it all part of that's uh, the same spectrum of experience? Um, I, think it, I think it is part of the same spectrum of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, because I work with a filter model of the mind-brain relationship, Mm -hmm. In other words, the brain filters mind and localizes it into a human being, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. mind, mind again, is not in the brain. Uh, the brain is in mind. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to have some kind of mystical encounter with this larger mind and whatever else in, it inhabits, you have to somehow shut down or compromise the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and one way to do that very effectively is with something like DMT or LSD mm -hmm. or mescaline mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very much in the school of thought that what psychedelics do to have their effects, it's not that they're producing these things like hallucinations out of the brain, although that's at work as well, but they're also shutting down basic brain functions and allowing other forms of reality and mind to rush in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is what Huxley thought, Aldous sure. Huxley, sure. Mm -hmm. and I think it's basically correct. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's just psychedelic substances, though. I think physical trauma does this sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think um, sexual trauma can do this. Mm -hmm. I think uh, heart attacks, car accidents, near-death experiences, uh, illnesses. Uh, I mean, all of these things have the potential to allow other, other forms of mind and being uh, to rush in. Mm -hmm. um, so I see it all on the same spectrum. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, the psychedelic question is, is so clouded over with moralisms and, sure. and legal history now that, mm -hmm. that we find it very difficult to think about. But I don't think it's so difficult. I think it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see yeah. that? It seems to me that there's, you know, there's such a loosening. Um, I, I, I wrote uh, the first feature article on the, on the Johns Hopkins psilocybin yeah. research into mystical experiences, and it seems like things are really opening up um, as, far as, the, as, as far as, you know, the, the legitimate, you know, academic study of psychedelics. Um, and I was wondering if you think that that parallels um, would would maybe could be a sort of a, a loosening um, as as sort of typified by your your article in the um, in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, which I was just amazed um, to to see the attention and the response that got. But you know, in such a in such a positive way. So, do you think that maybe you know because of the sort of work that you do, um, you know, maybe paralleled by by this also opening up of interest in psychedelic research, that maybe there's sort of a the humanities are, are sort of, you know, uh, uh, becoming more open to, to the paranormal as well? Well, I, I would like to think so, and, mm. and I, I, I think so. I, mm. My sense is that there's a great deal of interest in the paranormal, particularly among younger people, mm -hmm. um, with well, cu just a couple things, because I've thought a lot about these things. I... You know, the psychedelic thing, one of the things that frustrates me about a lot of the psychedelic research is um, that essentially it's premised on the authority of scientists. Mm -hmm. And 
they will study something like mystical experience and the last thing they've read about mystical experience was published in 1955 or 1965 <laughs> right. or something. No, I'm mean, seriously. Yeah, it's Walter true, Panky it's, or something, right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Walt, Walter yeah. Stace. Walter yeah, Stace yeah. is in the 50s. Right. Panky's in the 60s. They might have read a little Houston Smith in the 70s, but they've gotten <laughs> no further than that. And frankly, I find that offensive. Mm -hmm. um, we have been writing about mystical experience in the academy for centuries, and most of the literature actually appeared after 1970. Hmm. Uh, and the the field and the ideas have gotten incredibly sophisticated. And that a group of scientists would s claim to be studying mystical experience and never read anything after 1960, to me just suggests that they don't respect what we do. Mm -hmm. And they don't think we know anything. Mm -hmm. And I find that offensive. Um, and I, you know, I told them that actually. Um, so, because I want them to hear that. I, I want humanists and historians and philosophers to be part of this research. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to know what mystical experience is about, then give people who have studied mysticism their whole life LSD and mescaline mm -hmm. and ask them what happened. Right. That, that's how you're going to get to this issue. Mm -hmm. Not by giving people with no, no philosophical or theological training these things and then having them say how cool it was. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, I, and I'm being a bit mean, but, but I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm really frustrated yeah. Mm -hmm. by this this complete dismissal mm -hmm. of what humanists and philosophers and historians really do know and what we really could offer. Mm -hmm. And again, this is exactly what Aldous Huxley had in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His idea was, yep. his ex he was a, for God's sake, he was a humanist. He wasn't a scientist. And he thought that what we should be doing with these incredibly powerful chemicals is giving them to people who are trained to think about interior states mm -hmm. and all these nuances mm -hmm. and let's advance our science and our literature and our art and everything we can with them and that just isn't happening mm -hmm. um, so I, I you know I'm all for the new the renaissance in psychedelic research, but I'm still frankly very skeptical mm -hmm. um, because I, don't, I, 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 I just see a complete dismissal mm -hmm. of the people who know the most about these things. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of that is due to the fact that they're, they're afraid um, because, you know, the initials, you know, when, when you know, Gordon Wasson went down and met Mia, uh, Maria Sabina and took mushrooms for the first time in that culture they were used for divination and healing and things like that so so psychedelics were com absolutely associated with the the, the paranormal uh, right. the psi they, phenomenon right because they are <laughs> yeah and, and but but it's interesting when i've talked to a few of the uh, researchers off the record, they will say they're very interested in in looking at that subject. And there was a good bit of, um, you know, it was it was very minimal, and it doesn't hold up by you know today's scientific standards. But there was there was a good bit of research into psi phenomena and and psychedelics. And I think a lot of these um, researchers now are very aware of that. And you know, I I talked to one, who of course will have to remain off the record, but he said that. You know they've they've witnessed things. You know when when in some of this research, these people are, go to really deep places and have really profound, you know, psi experiences. So they see this in their labs, but they can't write about it. They're too afraid about it. I mean, it's they're already treading the edge of respectability, and they're so afraid by what happened. You know, after Leary and and everything and the in the late 60s and early 70s. So, so I think a lot of, you know, I think a lot of them, they, 
they would love to go there, but they just feel like they can't. Well, I get that. I understand. As somebody who's been censored and harassed, I, I understand that. Mm-hmm. But that, that doesn't explain why they don't pick up the phone and call people like myself or my yeah, colleagues. That's a, that's a good point. That's we're good not point. we're not going to make fun or harass them. And we have PhDs, and we teach at <laughs> respectable universities, and we can provide cover for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, that that's my larger point. I, mm. I get that. You know, to go back to our earlier conversation, I once had a long, I, I have a lot of parapsychology friends, people who are parapsychologists, and I just think they're wonderful. And they're, they're a very unusual lot on a lot of <laughs> levels. And one, of the t- one time I asked one of them, I was talking about this clear correlation between psi events and sexuality. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why don't, why don't, why doesn't anyone study this relationship? And his response <laughs> to me was, was essentially what you just articulated. He essentially said to me, look, Jeff, we're in enough trouble. You know? <laughs> we, we, we know there's a connection. We know that. Mm-hmm. But we can't even get people to listen to us talking about the simple <laughs> stuff, much less, you know, layering orgasm and, and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sex on top of it. <laughs> so I, I, I get that. I understand that. When, when, when you look at this phenomenon, when you look at uh, the, the altered states of consciousness and stuff and you compare – you know, uh, ayahuasca trips and shaman, shamanistic trips and the UFO phenomena, you can almost get away with saying, well, these are all altered states of consciousness. There's nothing physical here, but there's that those tantalizing pieces of physical evidence that that stick through and kind of throw a monkey wrench in that whole thing. Like, it would be completely simple if there weren't those little pieces of physical evidence. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, and, or, pieces yeah. of, or pieces of information that are clearly veridical. Mm-hmm. You, you know, yeah. pieces of, of precognition or clairvoyance in which the person really does know what's about to happen or what's happening at a distance. I mean, so, you know, that just, as you said, that just throws it all up in, in, into, a, into a mess. And, and you bring up the, the concept of the imaginal realm and, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Cor- Henri Corbin? Yeah. Uh-huh. uh-huh. But also Patrick Harper. Uh-huh. Mm. Wrote, wrote a considerable amount about the imaginal realm and how it reflects this phenomena. And you want you want to try and explain to people if you can what the imaginal realm would be. Well, yeah. So most people associate the imaginal with a French scholar of Islamic mysticism named Henri Corbin, who really brought it into use in a series of books on Persian. Uh, um, Shi- Shiite mysticism. And what he meant by it was the imaginal realm was this middle world between the spiritual world and the physical world that that is real and that the imagination under certain conditions can have access to this, this imaginal world of symbols that that are at once physical and spiritual at the same time. So it's a kind of middle realm that is is real but still partakes of, of the symbol or, 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 or the symbolic. Um, Corbin actually did not coin it. Um, he probably got it from Jung, who probably got it from Frederick Myers, mm-hmm. uh, who was this English psychical researcher and Myers meant something very specific by the imaginal he and this is where it's I think it's really interesting when he used the word he was thinking of entomology and in entomology an imago is the perfect mature form of the insect and its beginning stage is the larva so these are the larva and the imago are technical terms in etymology. And so the larval stage is the, the unformed, early, immature stage, and the imaginal stage of the insect is the adult, mature form. And so what Myers was doing was he was arguing that there are different functions of the human imagination. 
And then things like fantasy and daydream were in a kind of larval stage. But when people have telepathic experience, excuse me, when, when people have telepathic experiences or they're clairvoyant or they see into some other world, then the imagination is functioning in its mature or highly evolved form, and that's what he called the imaginal. Uh, so for Myers, the imaginal was essentially an evolved form of the human imagination that could imagine things that actually exist, that, that, that give it access to information that it can't get through the, the, the senses. Um, but I think the way the imaginal functions for Myers and Corbin and, and for a lot of people today, it's simply a way of acknowledging that some things that we imagine are in fact real and that the imagination is a kind of mediator between this other world and, and our senses. And so something can be both imagined, like Whitley can, Whitley can have these experiences of the visitors that are shaped by his professional horror writing and all the, the bad science fiction movies he saw as a kid, but they can also be expressions of something that's really there. Hmm. In other words, just because something's imagined doesn't mean it's imaginary. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I'll give you a simple, not so simple example. I, from my own life, I once had a dream in which um, there was a terrible storm coming from the other side of the street of our house, and I was at a, I was inside our house at the front door, trying to hold the door shut, and there was this horrible storm coming from from the other side of the street. And the next day, uh, a whole series of events played out in my life that involved the other side of that street and some terrible problems that that were coming into my my family life uh, from that exact direction. So that dream was Myers would say imaginal in the sense that it's a dream. I mean, there wasn't a literal storm, you know. I wasn't literally trying to hold my door shut, and yet the images and the symbolism of the dream was, in my mind, clearly uh, intuiting something that was going to happen within the next 24 hours. It was, it was precognitive. So it, 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 it knew what was going to happen, but it couldn't tell me literally, so it told me in a series of symbols. Um, so I, I was imagining that dream. That dream was a dream, and yet it wasn't a, just a dream. It was, it was telling me something about the real world and about the next day. Do you think that this plays in part any anything to do with the physical effects of the phenomena? You mean the abduction phenomena? Well, yeah, the paranormal slash abduction. I, I, I hate calling it just the abduction phenomena. Well... Maybe. I mean, it might have something to do with the electromagnetic stuff again. I, mm. You know, we do know that people, you know, there's this whole literature about people being struck by lightning who become clairvoyant or precognitive. Um, so maybe that might have something to do with it. I, for, me, for me, and in the book, so, so see, for me, the reason the imaginal is so important is it goes back to this notion of making the cut. We can take people's experiences seriously, no matter how extravagant they are, even if they're clearly imagined, but that doesn't mean that they're not real or that they're not about something real. It allows me to have it both ways, essentially, to, to acknowledge the symbolic content of the experience without writing or dismissing the experience away as just imaginary. Okay. So now, what, so I'm sorry well, to keep interrupting. One more thing. No. One more. Thing. So for me, the the best example of this is something Whitley once said to a group of us. He said, he said, "Look, I know that my experience of the visitors were shaped by the bad science fiction movies." 
that I saw as a kid. But I also know it was real, they were there. So he said, what we need to be doing now is we need to make better science fiction movies. <laughs> See, I see. I think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yes, because then you recognize that we're caught in this loop, mm -hmm. and that we're always perceiving these sticky webs that we're riding as a culture. We're never out of that, but we can make better webs, and we may well be interacting with some other form of mind or some even some other invisible species. But we can do that better if we just tell ourselves better stories and change the way we think about these things. And that's really what the book we wrote is about, is how do we make better science fiction movies? Mm -hmm. and do, you, do you have any examples? I mean, are there, is there anything that sticks out in, in that respect that, that you see being created nowadays? Well, so I'm in what I call my crabby phase. <laughs> I, I complain a lot about lots of people like I just crabbed to you about psychedelic researchers mm -hmm. so now I, I could be really crabby about filmmakers um, <laughs> but there are a few actually um, for example if you think about it um, I think the finest movie ever made about the UFO phenomena was Close Encounters. Oh, yeah. And if you think about Close Encounters, it's extremely faithful to the phenomenology of actual UFO events mm -hmm. until the last scene. <laughs> right. Right? right? Mm -hmm. And Jacques, you know, Jacques Vallée, so Jacques was a consultant on that. Mm -hmm. movie. He, he mm -hmm. begged Spielberg not to do the landing scene. <laughs> and of course Spielberg <laughs> ignored him. Uh, and if you, but if you think about that movie and you just remove the landing scene, wow, it is accurate. And, it's, <laughs> and then if you think about Star Wars, which came out a year before, mm -hmm. it's basically just a childish mm -hmm. shoot 'em up Western in outer space. Right. Is is that really the story we want to be telling? Mm -hmm. um, I hope not. And so what I'm always looking for is, can't we, can't we make a movie, folks, that, that is actually accurate? Mm -hmm. And can't, can't we even tell mm -hmm. our viewers that it's true? Mm -hmm. You know, what, one of my complaints with, with, with Hollywood and film is, they love the paranormal, but only if they can treat it as fiction. Oh, sure. Yep. Uh, well, why? Wouldn't it be, it seems to me it'd be even more interesting if they could do one that was presented as just what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. they, they like to pretend they do that. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't, though. Right. No, not the slightest. Yeah. I, you know, I've, t I've talked to them, too, and I've been crabby to them, too, and I... <laughs> And I'm like, wh why do you people, why can't you make a movie about the paranormal that doesn't involve spandex or things blowing up? <laughs> and their, their response to me is always, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, well, why can't you do that? And they, their, their response is, well, it won't make any money. And I'm like, well, how do you know it won't make any money? You've never tried, you know? So anyway, that doesn't go anywhere either. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting though. There, there's been quite the rise of uh, Gnostic themes in, in a lot yes. of films. You know, The Truman Show, and yeah. you know, obviously The Matrix, and things like that. So, you know, it seems like you know Hollywood they they, they can you know work with with concepts, but for some reason they they can't do that with with UFOs or you know entities or something like that. You know, it always just gets boiled down to the the scary thing or, you know, right. Well, it, always, it, right. it always gets boiled down to extraterrestrial or demon or ghost right. or there, there's no, they don't like in-betweens. Right. Right. I thought, you know, I thought um, Prometheus actually was gorgeous and really sophisticated. And then it just turned into a monster movie. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, that was yeah. That was a thing. disappointment. <laughs> 
So, you know, the alien was a, you know, a haunted house in outer space. So, you know, that, that, yeah. that's, that was what it was. Yeah. But with, yeah. with Prometheus, it, you know, it seemed like it was aiming somewhere. And then, like you said, it just, it just fell apart completely. The other, the other movie I always named that I really liked is a uh, powder. You guys mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a beautiful movie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it had a more positive take on things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you and Whitley disagree. It seems on his implant. Well, y- yes and no. I, I just didn't. You know, everybody has a line, right? That you don't, mm-hmm. you can't cross. And his implant story. I think he has an implant, and. I think it's really important to his no- narrative and self-understanding. I'm not denying the implant. He insists that real, live, ordinary human beings broke into his cabin and put it mm-hmm. in his mm-hmm. Um That may, in fact, be the case. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean... I wasn't there, obviously. I, 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 Whitley doesn't lie. I mean, peop, uh, this is where the debunkers are just wrong about him. He's one of the most honest and and had more integrity than anybody I've met. You know, so he's not he's telling us the truth when he says that. But again, as somebody who studies people's extreme religious experiences, just because someone's telling me the truth doesn't mean I think that's what happened. Right. Um, that's, you know, making the cut again. And that story, you know, it's either a military operation um, of some kind um, or, it's an, or it's an extreme case of, of a kind of religious experience that is mm-hmm. coded in that way. He may well be right. I mean, he may be not only telling us the truth. I know he's telling us the truth. Mm-hmm. He may be, in fact, be, be telling us exactly what happened. I... I don't know. I was just trying in the book to do something else with it. And again, trying to locate it in other contexts that might make sense of it. And so, you know, I related it to shamans who get crystals implanted in their body. Mm -hmm. St. Paul, who talked about a thorn from the, from Satan. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you also talk about your friend Dan's uh, experience with a honey jar, which was fascinating. Yeah, mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing. <laughs> you, you want to tell people that story real quick? Right. So, so I one of the things I like to do is I like to bring uh, intellectuals together, and then I like to ask them to tell tell me a story or tell us a story of something that happened to you that it's just totally over the top and, and maybe you've never even told anyone. And so this is one of those stories. It, it, it involves a very, very prominent uh, scholar of, of um, the Bible and uh, whom I know through a different a variety of contexts. And he, um, he was in his mother's kitchen uh, baking um, bis- biscuits or what, what were they? Um, muffins. Uh, blueberry muffins, and he the the recipe called for some honey, and so he went uh, to the cabin and he got to, this one of these big jars of honey, and he poured the cup of honey, and and hun- got all messy as honey jars do. So he he closed the honey jar and he put it under the water, and he washed it off, and he set it on the counter, and then he walked over to get the the tin of flour, and as he was pulling the tin of flour off the shelf, it suddenly got very heavy. And he dropped it, and the flower went all over the floor. And he noticed something inside the flower, and he he, st- he he kneeled down and he pulled out a honey jar, a wet honey jar from the flower. And he, uh, you know, he looked very carefully across the room where he had set the honey jar, and it was no longer there. <laughs> and he, they looked at the honey jar and it was obviously wet and was caked with flour now he was not taking anything he was in perfect uh, ordinary awareness it was middle of the day 
he is completely convinced that somehow the honey jar teleported from the sink to inside this flower. <laughs> and he has no idea why or how. Um, he said, um, I asked him what he thought about it, and he said, he said well, um, the first thought that popped into my mind is that materialism is false. <laughs> It's like, yeah, that's quite a thought, you know. But and obviously, it it presents problems. Things that teleport across the room present all kinds of problems. But, yeah. but that that that's what happened to him. And um, there it is, you know. And um, so I, you know, I told that story in the book because my my point was basically, look, if a honey jar can teleport across the room, uh, we can get any pretty much any object we want and it's small enough inside somebody's ear. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, the human mind, uh, I think Dan felt that somehow he did that, you know, mm. some, some, some unconscious realm of his mind did that. Right. And, um, I suspect he's right. Almost, almost like a poltergeist effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I suspect, or I suggest in the book that, you know, some aspect of Whitley, you know, put, put it in his ear too. But but again, I don't know that that that's not something like I would, you know, really argue with Whitley. Uh, we were just trying to have a conversation about probably the one of the strangest aspects of his life, and I was just trying to make sense of it in a way that, you know, wasn't just telling the story again. Isn't it possible using the 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 sort of imaginal realm idea that? This could manifest in his ear from there. Well, sure. Well, sure. Absolutely, like an apport or something, right? In a, in a seance, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and you know, again, that, those are the kind of models I suggest. But for Whitley, you know, he's very clear and very insistent that no, these were these were people who did mm -hmm. this. This was violent, and this was yeah. not something mm -hmm. I wanted, and. And, you know, they somehow took down his his uh, security system. Mm -hmm. And left a magnetic field around it? Yeah. Mm. This is the thing. I mean, one of the things, I don't know if I said this in the book, but this is the thing about this material is you think you've heard the last strange thing, and then it gets stranger. <laughs> and... What the debunker thinks is that, no, it all makes sense. If we just had enough information, it would all make sense, and it would all the strangers still go away. But my experience with these, these folks is exactly the opposite, that the more they tell you, the weirder <laughs> it is. Yeah. And the reason, part of the reason is, is, again, they don't quite trust you in the beginning, and so they tell you, just sort of the surface of the story. Mm -hmm. and then they tell you a little more and a little more. <laughs> and the more they tell you, the stranger it gets. It does not make more sense. It makes less sense. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's important. I think that's part of the phenomenon is that, yeah. that it's absurd mm -hmm. and that it, it's meant to confuse us. Mm -hmm. And I think when we look for it to make sense... I think we're we're going down the wrong path because um, it doesn't. One of the things we've talked about a couple of times now on the show in in depth is uh, sleep paralysis, uh -huh. and I, I personally at least feel that this could represent an altered state where we're dealing with some of these same entities right. in a different way. And you had a, a story in here. Of, uh, of one of your associates who had a sleep paralysis uh, experience that connected sort of to uh, Whitley stuff with the knocking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that was Adam. Was, that, was it Adam? I think so. Yeah. Well, this, again, this is where, you know, you have one of these weird things. I, you know, Adam was just – so Adam is a very accomplished writer, including on – on trance and, and mediumship. And mm. I was rooming with him once at a conference and he was talking, he was telling me about these uh, 
troll-like figures who had leapt on him, jumped on, jumped on top of him while he was sleeping, and and then they were knocking on the roof. And I just, you know, because I had just been working with Willie on this book, I didn't tell Adam. I said, well, what were the knocks like? And he said, well, they were in exact and precise threes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where, that's where you know, you just go, okay, the, some, <laughs> some, something's up. Because this is what Willie describes, too. He describes right. these little blue trolls and, and these, these knockings and, and perfect threes. Yeah, and of course it happens while you're working on the book with Whitley that he tells you the story. <laughs> right. <laughs> See, that gets back to the the writing as the as a paranormal practice again. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you tend. My experience writing is you you essentially attract things to yourself mm -hmm. once you start writing about something like this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What, what What do you make of synchronicity in relation to this stuff? Well, that's kind of what we're talking about, isn't it? I. Yeah. I um I, I think a lot of us I think synchronicity is a real thing. Um I think some synchronicities probably aren't the real thing. They're they're things we're just connecting mm -hmm. um to make meaning out of our lives. Um but I think there are these drop your jaw synchronicities <laughs> that, that are related. And I mean Jung's idea was of course that they're related through meaning. Uh, not through causality. And that's essentially the same idea I was trying to articulate in the Office of the Impossible book, is that what a paranormal event is is, is, a, is a system or a, a collection of meanings and, and references that are largely linguistic and textual, and that if you go looking for a cause or a mechanism, you'll never find one. Um, so I, I'm, I think synchronicity is... You know, it's a word that Jung and, and Wolfgang Pauli came up with to describe uh, an experience that's as, as old as the hills. Uh, and I think it just gives witness again to, to, to this, this other reality we're embedded in, where things are all hyper hyperlinked, essentially. Yeah. Um, one of the, you talk a, a little bit in the book about the, the what does the government know? And I, I've always had the feeling that the government doesn't really know much any of, of anything that has to do with this phenomena because they're probably looking at it from a materialistic viewpoint. That's my view. Yeah, my view, the last people you're going to should ask are engineers and rocket scientists. <laughs> you know, and I think if anything, they're, they're, they're pretending to hide stuff because they're, they don't have anything. <laughs> well, I, no, I think a lot of the... Yeah, for the people who haven't looked at the book, I at, at the end I basically say, I, look, conspiracy theories are are interesting and and people uh, adopt them for various reasons, but I think they're 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 the wrong path to go down, particularly with the government government conspiracies, because uh, I don't think they know anything either. Neither does Whitley, by the way. Whitley's convinced. Whitley thinks that. If I could speak for him, I, I think what Whitley thinks about the government piece is that the, the UFO files that are being held back are probably being held back because there is some evidence that these are plasmas that mm -hmm. are intelligent um, and seem to be controlled by some form of intelligence, but they don't have a freaking clue what they are or how to discuss that. Uh, yeah, and so they rather than just admitting one's ignorance and saying we don't know, um, you know, the the response is, is is to suppress the information. I don't think there's any grand conspiracy there. I don't I don't buy no. I don't buy the conspiracy theories. And and part of the reason I don't buy them is I've spent my whole life working in very large institutions. Institutions cannot hide things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, it, it's almost impossible. I won't say it's impossible, but it's nearly impossible. And anyone who's lived in, worked in a large enough institution that just knows instantly that you can't keep these huge secrets like underground UFO bases or <laughs> reptilian queens or what, what, whatever the theory is. It just doesn't work. It just, yeah. it just, no, it's not going to happen. You can't and, and keep I've, those secrets. 
wasn't it the the condine report that uh they kind of talked about that plasma idea yeah. and that it you know they were affecting our consciousness or something so yeah you, you know there's at least there's there's some indication on the record but uh but I completely agree. I mean, it's you know, it's uh, I think they're they're probably just as bewildered as we are. And do you think do you think that maybe it's because this phenomenon, whatever it is, it's it's approaching us as individuals, really, you know, rather than yeah. you know from a top down thing. I mean, it's, it seems to me like we're looking at something that's very bottom up, you know. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's what Jacques Vallée thinks too. <clears throat> that its real purpose and goal is to manipulate the the imagination of the culture and mm -hmm. and so you do that through people's dreams and interior lives you don't mm -hmm. you don't land on the, the white house lawn i i think the problem with all, the ufo material is that it's as, essentially what it is is a real physical religious phenomenon mm -hmm. for which we no longer have any adequate framework. We have so adopted uh, a, a materialist <laughs> or physicalist framework that we're just spiritually stupid. And so when something like this appears, all we can do is try to translate it into technology again, right? Yeah. So we, yeah. we turned it into spaceships and, and invading extraterrestrials when in fact, it's probably way more interesting and way, way weirder than that. It's, it, it's, it may well be some form of consciousness or some species that's interacting with us and probably has always interacted with us. Mm -hmm. And we've probably always understood it in religious terms. And not that that's correct. I'm not defending the religious frameworks. Right. I'm, I'm just observing that the religious frameworks are probably closer to what's going on than the technological ones. Mm -hmm. And this is what keeps leading us astray is we, we don't have any capacity to think about religious frameworks anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like we cast a, a version of our reality onto these things. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. We can't see it for what it is, so we, we, we cast that reality on, and then we think, okay, well, now we understand it. But, but, you know, part of it might be because it's using our minds to interact with us. Right, right. right. So it, it's not like it's our fault. It's that this is part of the phenomenon itself, is that it can only speak to us through our own cultural and linguistic capacities mm -hmm. and then we confuse those frameworks for what it actually is right. when it's really not that mm -hmm. but it can right. only speak to us through that and if we're co-creating it you know right. the fact that the fact that we're creating this horrible science fiction nowadays you know really <laughs> doesn't bode well does it no it doesn't <laughs> So, so what, one of the other points that you and Whitley kind of deviate a little bit on is Whitney's, Whitley very much has faith that science will, will find an answer to explain this type of stuff, but you, you, you kind of lean away from science as the ultimate answer here. Right, because, uh, again, this is my crabby phase, remember. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, the, the, the problem with science is that it, it treats everything as an object that it can measure and, and control and, and, and manipulate. And I think really what's at work here is, is subject or subjectivity or mind that isn't an object at all. It might use objects to, to, to communicate with us, but it is not an object. So I don't see how a method like the scientific method that was in, that was created to study and measure objects can tell us what this subject is. Um, I think you need other methods, other ways of, of knowing to do that, and I think those methods have been developed in the humanities. Um, that's what we study in the humanities. We study forms of subjectivity. We study forms of mind and how forms of mind are expressed symbolically in culture and language and art and and literature and philosophy and all these things. So I am um, yeah, much more 
skeptical about the limitations of, of science. I'm not anti-science. Oh, no, I, no. I, just, I just think we need to be really clear that I think the base assumption in our culture is that the only way of knowing anything about the world or ourselves is through the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's false. And, and, and reducing it. The reductionist sort of, we just keep taking it apart, we'll figure out how it works. Right. That's the scientific method, is, is reductionism and, and mechanism and materialism. And, and I, I just don't think that's going to get us to where we want to go with, with this material. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andrew Collins actually wrote an entire book on the whole idea of these things being plasma consciousnesses. Uh, and I, I thought it made a pretty good argument uh, for that. And it seems to mostly have gotten ignored by the UFO community because, of course, it's not positing the whole extraterrestrial thing. Right. Right. The Light Quest book. Well, yeah. Light Quest, that was excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really drawn to that, that basic idea. I, um, I think that's on the right track. Because, you know, light and, and, well, we call it plasma now, but it would have been called something else before. But the, the whole notion of light or energy is so central to, to the history of mystical literature, too. It's, it's really what it's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you get the, the different people hit by beams of light. Right. <clears throat> and then they have these revelations. I mean, it's, it's, it's so consistent as well as, like I've always said, you see a ball of light in a haunted house and it's, it's a ghost. You see it in the sky and it's a spaceship. <laughs> right. right, right. But that, that's the one thing you see in all this stuff are balls of light. Right. Um, that, Mike, do you want to? I know you had a few more you wanted to, to throw his way. No, I, I you know, I, I, I just wanted to say I, I, uh, I so appreciate the work that you're doing, and uh, oh yeah, and you know, and I, I've always felt that the, you know, the, the importance of this phenomenon is, like you said, it's that it, it is, this is what the humanities. Uh, you know, should be focusing on, and not the scientific realm. Like leave Jerry Coyne, um, <laughs> you know, in in his crowd. Uh, you know, to let them let them fume and fuss about it. Um, but I feel like you know, in a way, they're the the, the vehemence and the vitriol uh, that that the you know the debunker crowd is expressing towards this stuff is kind of a sign that they I think they feel like they're sort of slipping. And, uh, and I, I, so I'm, I'm so, <clears throat> excuse me, so appreciative that, 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 you know, a, a scholar, an academic like yourself is just, you know, keeping this material in the forefront. Like I said, that the article in the, in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, I thought was, uh, <clears throat> you know, that was a real game changer. And, uh, you could see from the reaction that it got that, that there's a real, there's a real thirst um, you know, among intellectuals to, to study this stuff. And, you know, even when I, I do talks on, on this, this stuff too. And, and the reason I do it is exactly the reason you said you do it is because afterward people start telling you their stories and you find out that every, you know, so many people have these stories. And, and I think what you're doing is such a, a an important thing. And that's allowing, you know, allowing people within, you know, an academic, uh, intellectual framework to be able to talk about this stuff. So, you know, I, I, I just really want to thank you um, for, and, you know, I, I devour your books and I, you know, I hope you keep writing them. <laughs> so, because I, <laughs> I will you. keep reading them. They're not, so you're, they're not, they're not Kleenexes to me, you know, I mean. They're, so you're the, you're, <laughs> you're the guy, you're the guy standing by the river catching the Kleenexes, it sounds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and putting them up on my top <laughs> shelf, you know. <laughs> well, that's, I really appreciate that, Michael. I, you know, it's why I keep writing. It's because there are lots of people out there like yourself, doing similar things. And I, I think there is a community, and I think we are getting somewhere. And I think people do want to talk about this, but they want to talk about it in a way that doesn't embarrass them. Yeah, and, exactly. and I think, I think that's part of, the, part of the, our task here, is to forge a, a conversation and a vocabulary that isn't embarrassing. It's not cheesy. It's not, um, 
it's sophisticated, but not not jargonish. Right. And um, you know, when I speak to intellectuals, and I don't just speak to intellectuals, I don't mean to just keep invoking them, but I I really do think they're gatekeepers mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. some way, and that's why I'm so concerned about them, and why I keep crabby cra- cra- being crabby with them is. You know, one of the things I keep telling them is all of these terms that, that you're so afraid of, like paranormal and psychical and telepathy, these were all invented by your intellectual ancestors. Right. At people like <laughs> at places like Cambridge and, and Harvard and, and Duke and, and you know, these are not these none of these terms were, were coined by the tabloids. None of them. There there right. there are words. And they, they were really sophisticated when they were first created, and they've lost those those nuances, but, but we can get, get it back, mm-hmm. and we can come up with new words. And um, that's, I think, what writers do is, mm-hmm. is, at their best, is they invent new words, and when they invent new words, they invent new worlds. And then right. people can have new experiences. That's that co-creation you were talking mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. And and I think this stuff in particular, I mean, you know, when when, when the, the average person looks at the UFO thing, they say, well, you know, it'd be neat if there was life on other planets. But, I mean, as we've been talking about uh, tonight, it's it's so much more than that simplified sort of view. This, whatever this is, touches down to the very core of what we are. And I think understanding it is incredibly important. And... It's unfortunate that so many people don't realize that, that they block so much of it out and just kind of simplify it down. And I think books like yours are hopefully going to help wake people up a little bit to how deep this phenomena really is. Yeah, I hope so too. But um, what are you planning next? Well, <clears throat> so I got two things on the burner. I. I'm finishing a, a, a book, another book for Chicago called Secret Body, um, in which I basically take these six books, six or seven books I've written, and try to figure out what the hell I'm trying to say in, <laughs> in all of the, in all of them. In other words, I'm trying to figure out what what's the secret body underneath uh, the corpus. What, what what's the vision here, and mm-hmm. and is there a, is there a there there, or is it just a is it just six or seven scattered books, or is there a, a, a real coherent kind of theory at work here? And of course, I think the latter. Uh, and so that that'll come out hopefully next year. And then I'm also working with um, a woman here in Houston who was struck by lightning mm. uh, in 1988 and uh, developed all kinds of massive precognitive and clairvoyant capacities. Mm. Oh, wow. And I'm working, her name's Elizabeth. I'm working with Elizabeth to really to tell her story. It's really her book. Mm. Um, but I'm sort of her, her helper or her, I'm a ghostwriter who's not really a ghost. <laughs> um, and so, a corporeal writer, right? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's actually, the model is actually similar to what I just did with Whitley. It's, it's a, mm. It'll be a co-written book on Elizabeth's experiences and with, you know, commentary by me trying to, to you know, contextualize it and make some sense of it. Mm. Um, nice. All right. Yeah. Bring, it, bring it on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what, what's your outlook for when that's going to be finished? Well, I don't know, actually. We, we're, we've yeah. just really begun it. Uh, we'll, we'll work on it all summer and into the fall. I, you know, I'm hoping we have something done by the new year, and, and so probably the next year, hopefully, if all goes well. These things, you know, you'd, writing books is a, it's, it's kind of dicey, and it, sometimes it takes a while to find the right editor and the right publisher. Mm. So. And where can people find you online? Well, so I have a web, website, uh, just, it's called, uh, it's just kripal.rice.edu. That's, that's by far the there are some very dubious things about me online. I would not trust everything you read about me, <laughs> including the Amazon reviews of Kali's Child. I, right. Yeah. So, but but if you go to kripal.rice.edu, there 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 are pretty coherent uh, little essays on all of the books and essays, 
And I also send people to Jones Cinema Arts. Uh, Scott Jones is a friend of mine who's optioned two of my books and is working on documentaries on authors of the impossible and, and the Esalen history. Um, so nice. th those are the two main places. All right. Well, I thank you very much for spending some time with us. Well, I thank you guys. It was fun. You, I do a lot of these interviews and it's always apparent very quickly whether the interviewers have read two pages of the book. <laughs> yeah. I can, could tell immediately you had read more than two pages. So. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> and it was a fantastic book. As I said, everyone should pick it up and, and read it if you're interested in this stuff because we barely scratched the surface. I mean, it's 350 pages, and it's uh, there's just so much in there. Yeah, and then go get uh, Mutants and Mystics and Authors of the Impossible. All right. Yeah, go pick up those Kleenexes. <laughs> Which I normally wouldn't do, but in your case, I'll pick <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoyed that. That was our talk with Jeffrey Kripal. We are hoping to eventually have him back for a roundtable discussion, and we'll get into much more of his stuff. His book, as uh, I've said in the interview, is well worth reading, well worth picking it up, The Supernatural. Uh, upcoming, we will have Stuff Young back on very soon to talk about her latest book. Jeff Ritzman will be joining us to talk about some of his experiences. And I have a few others that I, I don't really want to say who they are yet until I get them confirmed. But stay tuned and uh, lots of fun stuff to come.